So after the sermon last Sunday, as we're driving home, my wife says, Ray, you got to watch what you say when you're preaching. And I'm thinking, what in the world is she talking about? And, uh, and she was right, though. The donations have just flooded in. I've got pounds of chocolate to go through now. And I'm going to start enjoying them this uh, evening during the football game. But uh, thank you anyways. I do not need any more chocolate. And I didn't mean to say that I wanted your chocolate. I gladly receive it, but uh, this pains me to say it, but please no more chocolate. We are in Romans this morning, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I want to start off by talking about something. It's called animism. Animism. Now, animism is the belief that objects, places, and creatures all possess a distinct spiritual essence. Some objects, some of these objects, and not like a of God, some separate or different kind of spiritual essence. Some objects eventually stand out because of some quality or some function, and become the object of worship. So, for example, some places in the world believe that a particular tree, for example, is sacred, and because the tree is sacred, a particular tree is sacred, that such trees, they become the kind of center point for prayer, to hold gatherings, to perform certain cultural or cultic rites and rituals, and in their mind, it's wrong to cut some such trees down or kill that animal or or whatever this is uh, called animism and this approach has been taken of 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 ground sacred ground so you have the idea of sacred ground you have stones and cows and rivers and everything else under the sun including the sun to be worshiped by people throughout the, the world uh, in uh, these days there's a movie called avatar which is gaining some notoriety or our attention at least, and I haven't seen the movie, but there is what's called the tree of souls. And this is a perfect example of animism where you have this spiritual or, or the, the souls, the, 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 the animating life force of others just kind of uh, take up in the tree and the tree becomes the center or the object of worship. Now, along with animism, there's another thing. It's called syncretism. And this is this becomes more of an issue as you move towards Christianity and people start becoming saved. You have the combining, it's not just a, it, with Christians, but this, there's a combining of two things, combining of two philosophies, a combining of two religions. So throughout the history of the church, you have the gospel being taken out and sh- shared and spread throughout the world. And many people have believed in the gospel, but having believed in the gospel, they are still immature in the faith, and what they tend to do is, in their spiritual immaturity, to combine their newfound faith in Jesus with their old, long-time practices of their false religions. That's syncretism, bringing the two together. So you might have things like worshiping God on Sunday, but going back to your cultic practices throughout the rest of the week. That's syncretism. And uh, even worse than this is to kind of take what you have believed in your previous religion or way of life and bring it into the practice of your religion. So it's kind of interesting. If you go to other parts of the world, let's say India, and you have a lot of Christians in India, even though it's not predominantly Christian, if you uh, view some of these Uh, people in their worship on Sunday, it's not like we worship. It's different. And why is it different? Because their worship is culturally impacted. Uh, It's not always bad, but that accounts for the differences between the way that we worship. I remember I was in Florida, and I was helping out at a little church, and there was this group, and they're from, they were an, an Indian group, and they wanted to use our facilities to worship. So we said, sure, you know, we're, we're open to, you know, they were Christian, and they wanted, we were open to allowing them to come and use our, our, uh, our building. I remember the first Sunday we came after they had their first service in our building, and the whole place smelled of the incense that they were burning. And we thought, what in the world are they doing here? 
But that's just kind of an example of that. Uh, other elements of syncretism or other examples of syncretism is, is uh, when people start to say things like, well, God spoke to me through the river, or God spoke to me through the fortune cookie. And we start to take elements of our society and our former religious practices and bring them into our faith. That's syncretism. And actually, if you pay careful attention to the Bible, you will find examples in the New Testament where Paul or Peter or something is, is kind of resisting and pushing against some practice that they have allowed to come into the church. And they're doing it because of their former way of life. And, and those words are used frequently. When I was teaching in Zambia, and I was just reflecting on my time in Zambia this past weekend, I've been to Zambia eight times, and it's hard to believe that I had gone so many times. And I'm missing it. I haven't gone in several years now uh, since the beginning of COVID. But anyways, one of the purposes of the college where I was teaching at, one of their purposes was to educate the pastors, because the pastors were doing this very thing. They were taking their spiritualism and combining it with their Christianity and they had some wrong teachings. And so uh, the college's purpose or intent was to help teach these pastors and instruct them to build them up in their knowledge and understanding of the Word of God so that they could have a uh, more truthful kind of worship. So what's going on? Why this practice by people throughout the world and throughout history? We want to keep what we like, and this is the heart of syncretism. We want to keep what we like, and we also want to add to it or give ourselves to this new faith which we know and believe and understand to be important. So we want kind of the best of both worlds. And this is, uh, this is the danger that we fall in. And this is what I want to kind of talk to or touch upon today in our message in Romans chapter 12. If you turn to Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read verses... 1 and 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So as we consider this, we have these three exhortations found in the passage. First of all, you have present your bodies to God. And this is what we talked about last week. This is where you take yourself, your body, your being, you take who you are and you offer it as a gift to God, to serve Him. It is like Isaiah, in the call of Isaiah, we find in Isaiah 6, where God comes and appears to Isaiah and He takes through the angels, he takes the coals and he puts it on his lips. And he says, now your iniquities are forgiven. And then he says, I think broadly speaking, he says, who will I send? And Isaiah responds, here I am, send me. That is the idea of taking ourselves and presenting ourselves to God. It is this willing submission to yield ourselves to God and to do what he wants us to do in our lives. So we talked about that last week. Today, we want to go to number two, and it says, and the point is this, do not be conformed. In verse two, it says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. And this is what I would like to address today. Don't be conformed. Now, what does the word conformed mean? The word conformed means to take yourself and to shape, to be shaped according to a pattern or a mold. It is to make your behavior, make your behavior like something else. And so in this passage here, we're told not to be conformed to the world. So let me bring out this thing here. My wife makes this stuff. This is Play-Doh, you see that? So this is you, you're the Play-Doh. Can you see yourself in, your play, in the Play-Doh? So it says, do not be conformed. The word conformed means to take yourself and to shape yourself like something else. So this star represents the world, and to be conformed to the world is to take yourself and make yourself like it. So you become like the star, like the world. That's what it means to be conformed. 
Rather, as Christians, what are we supposed to do? I've got this fancy schmancy cross cutter here. So we are to take ourselves and conform ourselves to Christ. So that's what the passage is exhorting us to do. This is us. We are going to shape ourselves or pattern ourselves after something. Don't pattern yourself after the world. Don't make yourself like the world, but make yourself like Christ. So this is the meaning of to be conformed here. Now, I have to say that before we criticize other parts of the world for their syncretism, we might not be animistic here in the West, but we are secular. And what we tend to do as Christians is we tend to combine our Christianity with our secularism. And we are not any less like other parts of the world who take their religions and combine them to their Christianity, we are just in the flesh, we are just as guilty. And if you look at churches today in the United States, there, there is often the criticism that the church has kind of taken in the things of the world. And in many cases, that is true. And it's something that we have to guard ourselves. It is not necessarily that the things of the, the world are, are bad in and of themselves. But if we put them in a... In a improper place in our lives and give a priority to them that is beyond what they deserve, then we are guilty of taking that thing and making it a part of our faith and our Christianity. And the exhortation and the encouragement here is not to be conformed to the world. Don't make yourself like the world. As a matter of fact, we'll see in some of these verses that Christ has taken us out of the world and what the New Testament writers are, will say, he's taking us out of the world, and they'll say, why are you going back to the world if he has saved you from it? So this is kind of the heart of the exhortation. So what is wrong with the world? Why are we not to make ourselves like the world? Well, there are several things I'd like to suggest. First of all, worldly things are contrary to spiritual things. There is a fundamental difference between that which is material and temporal and worldly and that which is spiritual and of God. There is a fundamental difference there. And there has to be a primary, for the Christian, a primary casting of ourselves on the things of God and of, of uh, the things that belong to Him and a resistance or a walking away or a kind of a refusal of worldly things. So we have to be careful for that. We find such verses like 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So notice here, this is a pretty all-encompassing verse. And it, John warns the Christian that everything that is in the world has this appeal to us, to our flesh and uh, to our desires and, and to our aspirations. It has this appeal to us, in, you know, naturally speaking, and this appeal that drives us towards these things has to be something that we have to withstand and withhold. And so we look to God, we look to the Father, and when we give up our sins and our burdens, we lay them down through the work of Jesus on the cross and we come to him, he delivers us from this world. We have to continue to go after him and not set our affections upon worldly things. In 1 Peter chapter, 13, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, it is, this is the only other passage in the New Testament where this word conform is found. It says in verse 13, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, and here's our word, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So, first, notice how it says in verse 13 that we are to rest our hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we've been talking about hope. If you remember, we looked at Romans chapter 4 and how Abraham hoped contrary to hope or hoped against hope. And we saw that what that meant, possibly, is that uh, from all appearances, naturally speaking, in Abraham's life, 
It seemed impossible that God's promise would be fulfilled in his life. It was impossible. There was no human way, if we could put it that way. There was no human way it was going to come about. But he continued to put his hope in God, and he continued to have faith in him that God is able to do what is impossible, that he is able to call or give life to the dead and to call the things that don't exist into existence. God is able to do all of that. Therefore, we should never give up our hope. But it's not just hope or wishful thinking that something is going to turn out well for us. It is resting our hope fully. This means to take all that we hope for, all of our hopes, and rest them fully on the grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Only then can we have the peace and the joy and the assurance that things, that, that things are going to work out all right because we're in God's hands, right? He's going to work everything out. We don't need to be afraid if we are trusting in God. So here it is. Rest your hope fully on Christ. Look to him fully, completely. Don't be turned aside. And when he appears, we will have the full measure of our salvation at hand. As obedient children, notice the link to obedience. And this is really a strong link to our Romans 12 passage. For Paul is exhorting the believer to do these things. Present your bodies, don't be conformed. There's, there's a, an act of service, which is an act of obedience. So as obedient children, don't conform yourselves to your former lusts. So that's what I said. Jesus called us from the world, right? He took us out of the world. Why are we going to go back to the world? Don't do that. Your former lusts, don't do that. Instead, become more like Jesus. Become more and more like him. As obedient children, don't, don't uh, yield yourselves to your former lust. So if we allow ourselves to be driven by our desires, we will end up like we were without Jesus. And that was not a good place for any of us. Instead, we have to yield ourselves not to our former desires, but to, our, to the Spirit of God that lives and dwells within us. And so we are to therefore be holy. Why? Because he is holy, right? So we want to be like him. He is holy. We don't want to be conformed to the world any longer. He is holy. So be holy as he is holy in all your conduct. So first, worldly things are contrary to spiritual things. Second, the cares of the world prevent our growth. Now, now this is really uh, significant here. If we look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Matthew 13, verse 22. Jesus is sharing this in a parable that he was teaching the people. And uh, you know the the parable of the sower and the the seed. The sower goes out and he casts the seed on the ground and some falls on uh, the hard ground and so on. So here he says in Matthew 13, 22, He who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Now, I'm going to take this from a Christian perspective here, and we learn from this passage that if we are caught up in the cares of this world, we will be hindered in our spiritual growth. Yeah, I don't think that this is any surprise. I mean, how many times have we faced something in our life that just caused so much stress and anxiety, we're just not able to focus on other things? Has anybody been there? You know, We, we just get so caught up in our circumstances. And, the, and it's not that our circumstance or our situation is our fault, necessarily, or even in our control. A lot of times the cares of the world you know, are, are out of our control. But... Nevertheless, if we're not careful, we can allow our cares, our troubles, our situations to just kind of immobilize us and keep us and hinder us from progressing in our way, our walk with the Lord. The word choke here it says, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And the word choke means to impede the growth of. That's what it means. So we are choked 
by our cares and our circumstances. And what we have to do is learn as Christians to take our heart and our affections and our emotions and our minds and all, you know, our, all of ourselves, take them off of focusing so much on these things that are in front of us and learn how to rest our hope fully in Jesus Christ. He is the one who will bring deliverance. He is the one who can uh, uh, deliver us from anything that we face. And this is not an automatic thing. We have to struggle and learn and we have to wrestle through this and and grow in our response to him. But don't allow the world to prevent your growth or to choke out your spiritual growth. You might be facing an, an obstacle that is like a mountain in front of you. And it just looms over you, looms large and threatens to squash you. Don't give up your hope in Jesus. He is your deliverer with the word. He can move that mountain out of the way. And even if he chooses not to move the mountain out of the way, he gives the grace that we need in order to face our mountain and to successfully manage it and handle it through his help. So don't let the cares of this world prevent your spiritual growth. There ought to be a continual or a regular growth in your relationship with Jesus Christ. The third thing that is potentially wrong with the world is that the world causes misplaced affections. The world causes misplaced affections. Now, uh, we know that we're supposed to love God, right? Love God with all that we are, not let anything come, you know, between us and God. We all know that. That's, that's nothing new. But the world and sinfulness, and uh, uh, they can be tricky, and they sneak up on us, and they come around the corner, and it comes uh, disguised as peanut M&Ms, right? Yummy, this is good. I'm going to take my fill of it. And uh, we're caught off guard, or it's just kind of a sneak attack. It's a surprise to us oftentimes. We don't want to love the world, but what we end up doing is we end up placing our affections or too much affection on the things that are around us and not enough of our affection goes to God. So in Roman in 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 it says do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, to gauge how much you love something, you can maybe uh, how, how easily are you willing to relinquish it? And the things in the world should be just kind of get, leave, take it or leave it kind of thing, right? So if you come up to me and, uh, Pastor, can I have your bag of M&Ms? If I love these M&Ms, oh, look, it says pastor size on it. I just noticed that. <laughs> So if you come, Pastor, can I have your bag of M&M's? Well, I'll prob- probably give it to you without batting an eye. Probably. Can I take a five-minute break here? I'm going to go, i got to go blow my nose or something, right? I'm going to eat these real fast. But, but you see, I'm not, I'm not connected to it. It's take it or leave it. I, I love them, but I love God. And if, you, if I need to give this to somebody else, I will without hesitation. And that, that's where we guard our affections and we make sure that we don't misplace them. So maybe there's something in your life as we approach Easter, uh, the resurrection, uh, the Catholic Church, they, had, they had observed Lent. And, you know, I'm not Catholic and I don't aspire to Catholicism, but that doesn't mean that we have to cast out everything. And the idea of sacrificing something for any period of time in the name of the Lord is not a bad thing. And just because they do it doesn't mean that we shouldn't or can't. But the point is this, that it might be a good practice, whether we're coming to Easter or not, in your life to put aside some of the things that you enjoy doing just for a short period of time to, set your, to teach yourself to set your affections upon God and not on those things. So it's not a bad thing to put something that you love aside for the sake of God. That's always a good thing. 
The world tends to steal and to sap our affection. And by stealing and sapping our affection, it steals our strength and our time and our efforts and our abilities to give ourselves to God. And that's where we have to be careful. We are to set our minds on heavenly things. As it says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. And so we find here in Colossians that there is this dichotomy between heavenly things and earthly things. And again, it's not that the earthly things are necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but anything that will take our affection away from God and divert us is wrong. And we have to learn to turn ourselves back to Christ first while we enjoy the blessings of the fruitfulness of this earth, which is the gift of God. So if we are raised with Christ, let us learn to turn our attention to heavenly things. And, you know, we can ask ourselves, if I was heavenly minded, more heavenly minded, if I was spiritually minded, if I was really thinking about Jesus more than some of the things that are around me, what would change in my life? What would be different? What adjustments might I make to reflect my love and devotion to him as opposed to living for the things that are around me? So if we are raised with Christ, if we have been saved by Jesus and the blood of, of uh, Jesus has forgiven us of our sins and we have been redeemed by it, if that is true, and of course he is seated at the right hand of the Father, let us look to Jesus as we seek to live our lives and escape this world through him. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, talking about what Jesus did, it says, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So Jesus came to deliver us from this age. Let us not go back to the things of this age, but let us look to him until he sees fit to take us to be with him forever. Jesus is the one that delivers. And we are able to do this, not in our own strength, but by the helper that has been given to us. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 this time, so a couple chapters back. And I want to read this powerful passage in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And I could read more verses, but I'll just read the first six here. And notice, notice what it says about our walking with him. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, praise the Lord, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And I really want to focus on those last couple of verses there. We don't want to set our minds on the things of the flesh. We don't want to be found living according to the flesh. We want to live according to the Spirit and set our minds on spiritual things. That should be the driving force of our lives and of everything that we do. We are to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God who lives within us, who guides us, who directs us, who empowers and strengthens us. We are to yield ourselves to the Spirit. Let us then be spiritually minded. Spiritually minded. Let us think on the things of God continuously. And let our reflections on the truth that is found in Jesus, let the, our reflections on the truth conform us into the image of Christ. And what that means for us, for all of us, is that we have to gauge our activities, we have to uh, examine the things that we do, everything, and make sure that we are yielding it all to Jesus. 
we have to make some adjustments, all of us. We have to make adjustments in our lives because we live in this flesh. We, because we live in the flesh, we, were, we are constantly directed by the desires of the flesh, and we constantly have to check that. So let us examine ourselves day by day, moment by moment. Let us, let us uh, gauge where we stand in our love and affection for Jesus. Let us adjust the things in our lives that need to be adjusted. That is growing in our faith. It is constantly making adjustments, one adjustment after another. And when we come back next Sunday, we should be a little stronger spiritually, a little more mature spiritually than we are today. Amen? So let us go forth in Jesus' name and glorify him, not being conformed to the world, but being conformed to the image of Christ. Let's stand as we sing our final song this morning.